Hall B is the smallest of Jefferson Lab's four experimental halls. It is equipped with the 12 GeV CBAF Large Acceptance Spectrometer, or Class 12 for short. Class 12 is a large system of detectors for tracking and measuring subatomic particles. As experiments begin, a target is inserted into a recessed notch in the Class 12 detector systems, so that the detectors almost completely surround the target. Electron beams enter the target and interact with the particles inside, such as nuclei, the protons and neutrons in the nucleus, or their quarks. Particles that come flying out from collisions inside the target are measured in the Class 12 detectors, which can record several terabytes of experimental data every day. Experiments carried out in Hall B are fundamental investigations into the nature of matter aimed at focusing and shaping our understanding of nuclear physics from the subatomic scale to the scale of the universe. Hi, welcome to this episode of Bite Size Science at Jefferson Lab. My name is Nobuo Sato. I'm a staff scientist at the Division of Theoretical and Computational Physics. And for today, I'm going to talk to you about um, interesting efforts at Jefferson Lab in exploring the walls of quarks and gluons. So just before we get started, let me tell you that there will be a Q&A at the end of this talk and feel free to think about questions as post them there on YouTube. All right, so let's get into um, uh, the discussion. So I will start by posing a question uh, here, uh, which is what is our wall made of? How is the things that we see in our daily life actually made of? And as I'm going to tell you, this is a story about scales. This story actually started more than 2,000 years ago by this guy called Democritus, who had this idea that everything was made of atoms or something very small that you cannot partition. So like an apple, actually, if you can keep partitioning, eventually you will start seeing objects like a fructose, which is very, very tiny, something that you can actually do in your kitchen, obviously. And then if you actually zoom in even more, you will reach out the so-called atoms, which is presumably what he was thinking. However, that's not entirely true because we already know today that the atoms themselves are, are made of something even deeper. Namely, there is a core of protons and neutrons surrounded by a cloud of electrons. And these things are very small, about 10 to the minus 12 meters. Now, the story that I'm telling today is not about even that. It's something even smaller, which is something called quarks and gluons that are sit inside of these protons and neutrons, okay? And this, they actually live in their own world. They cannot escape for reasons that I will explain a bit. Um, and then their world is of the size of 10 to the minus 15. And this scale has its own name. It's called the Fento scale. And these particles, the quarks and gluons, are actually part of a bigger family of particles so listed here in this chart. So in the upper side, you have the quarks um, that I just mentioned. And in the lower side, you have something called the leptons. Uh, the particular ones that you might know is, for instance, the electrons, uh, which are conducting in any cable that you see. Now, in this inner part of this chart, we have something called um, the messengers which are particles that allow to these particles to talk each other, okay? And one of them that probably is familiar to you is the so-called photon, because that's the particles that allows us to see. It's basically what the, made is light, what the light is made of. Now, there is another particle called the gluon, and these particles actually make um, these particles, to these quarks, to be uh, confined inside of these systems that we call protons and neutrons. So the name is very suggestive. The gluons uh, held these particles together. All right, so the next question that comes in is how these particles really interact. I already hindered this thing by mentioning that there are some messengers. So let me just give you sort of a gist of how this more or less work. So imagine that you and your friend, you're, seeing, you're standing in a boat 
on the lake and you are going to exchange a ball with your friend. Now you can sort of imagine that when you actually throw a ball, you will actually recoil against the ball, like you know when you push against a ball. Um, and then when the ball um, is received by your friend, um, it will, your friend will start moving also backwards. So you can see that by exchanging a ball, uh, you and your friend will start moving apart, right? This is a really bizarre way of interacting or communicating with your friend, but this is basically what happens when these tiny particles that I was talking about earlier. Now, the physics laws that tells you about how these things actually operate, uh, at least with your friend and the ball, are very simple, and they are encoded into something called the Newtonian mechanics. However, for the elementary particles that I was talking about, the rules of physics are way more complicated. And they look more or less like this. Now, I know that this is a really, really intimidating uh, set of expressions, but the way that you can sort of, uh, uh, sort of see or interpret this, you should see this thing as like a code. There is a code that nature obeys at these tiny scales uh, by these, all these particles, and this is called the standard model. Now, a particular part of this code that is very, very intriguing and difficult to understand, and that's why we are discussing this, is the first line only, which is associated with how quarks and gluons interact each other to form these bound states of protons and neutrons. And this line, this piece of a code, has its own name called quantum chromodynamics, and it's also known as QCD for short. All right. So now that I'm telling you what the universe that we see are made of and how these tiny particles interact with each other, the next question that I would like to pose is how do we actually know this thing, right? Because we cannot really go into a kitchen and cut the, an apple up until we get to the quark level. So something that we cannot do at the kitchen, we can actually do in experiments. And this is done by poking the proton in a specific way, and which I'm going to explain to you. So here is a particular experiment that it was conducted in Hamburg, Germany around the 90s. And basically what they did was to circulate protons at almost a speed of light in one direction and electrons in the opposite direction also at the speed of light. And then they were allowed to interact in these intersection points where, where they had detectors. Basically, view from the transverse side of the detector, the electrons come from the left side the proton comes from the other side and they collide. So what happens here is that the incoming electron gets scattered off because it basically hits something inside of the proton when it pokes it. And then once it gets scattered off, it will get recorded uh, by the detector, which is nothing but a camera, a camera that can see where it, will, where it landed and with what energy uh, it had. And most of the time, the proton actually get destroyed in this high energy uh, an energetic collision. And there are other particles that comes out of that that are not quarks and gluons, but instead they are particles made of them. So in reality, the important thing here is that we never see quarks and gluons, but we only see objects that are made of them, okay? Um, all right, so in order, to, in order to understand what's going on here, um, in order to understand why quarks and gluons or how they look like, we actually have to make many, many measurements. And the idea is that every time that we actually make the collision, the outgoing electron goes in many different ways. Um, different ways that looks almost random, but not entirely random. And this is the key. The fact that it's not entirely random allows us to really pin down what's going on inside of the proton. So in order to do that, we take all this information that are recorded by the detector and we project, it, project them into histograms. So here is a particular histogram that tells you the momentum against the scattered angle. And you can see what, what, is, what is in each of these cells is basically the number of times that an outgoing electron was observed with certain momentum and certain angle. And you can see from here that certain regions it is more likely the, the electrons to appear and there are regions that are less likely. It is this non-randomness that allows us to really connect with the world of quarks and gluons, which requires some theoretical uh, input. So roughly speaking, just going back to the picture of what's going on, 
there's an electron coming in, it will poke the proton, and what's going to happen is that uh, the electron will exchange a photon most of the time uh, with, this, with the constituent of the proton, which could be a quark of a gluon, and then this exchange particle is basically analogous to the story that I told you with your friend in a boat exchanging a, exchanging a ball. So essentially, the quarks and gluons talk each other you know, in, a, in this more or less this fashion using those codes that I mentioned, that are complicated codes that I mentioned earlier. Now, of course, the scattered electron will move in different angles, in different directions, depending on what exactly is uh, scattering of. And sometimes it, it, it will depend basically on the energy of the, of the quark of gluon that is scattering, right? So in order to understand or be a little bit more uh, precise, so imagine that you have a system of quarks and gluons together, collectively is the proton, moving with certain momentum p, and then each of these will carry certain momentum fraction uh, relative to its parent proton. So the momentum fraction is this x, and we can actually formula, formally define a probability distribution, which, is, which tells us how the quarks and gluons are distributed. Notice that as soon as I talk about how quarks and gluons are distributed, I am really exploring the internal structure of the proton. So basically, I know some information about this, uni this microcosmos where the these guys live. And this is, by the way, is only a one-dimensional structure, and I will touch base on that a little bit later. So these histograms that I just mentioned, which is what experiments can actually measure, can be actually matched uh, using a theoretical setup where we can actually calculate a piece of this connection, which is called the collision-dependent factor, which is basically this part associated with how the uh, electron can talk to the quarks and gluons using those rules that I said earlier. And it is convoluted. Convolution is kind of a complicated uh, product with this pattern densities, which is this probability distribution for how, to, how the quarks and gluons are distributed in the nucleon. So basically what we do uh, in order to explore this microcosmos is more or less like that. We model this function, which tells us the internal structure, and we actually try to match them with the, with the histograms that are, ex that are observed by the experiments. And, and this is how we explore the wall of quarks and gluons. All right. Um, once you do that, then you know, these functions, like the, the proton distribution functions, look more or less like that. You know, they come in different flavors because the gluon is, the, there are many quarks, in, many different flavors of quarks in the proton, like the up quark, the down quark, and strange quarks. So each of these are basically characterization of how they are distributed with the gluon. And scientists like me are always pushing the need to be able to resolve, you know, more precisely how this look like. Okay. So I should mention that Protons are really living in three dimensions, just like us. We are made of also protons, right? And so protons, you know, the quarks also move in three dimensions, uh, can move in three dimensions within the proton. So there are other exotic ways to explore the internal structure, not just this one-dimensional picture, but something in two dimension or three dimension going into the transverse momentum distributions and generalized proton distribution. Moreover, we can actually do something even crazy in the lab where we can actually change the whole microcosmos by polarizing them. So we can really change the whole setup and see how these quarks and gluons can react when we actually change the polarization of the gluon, sorry, of the proton. And in general, this is basically goes under the name of nuclear photography, which is an endeavor to try to map out this microcosmos using these poking experiments. Um, nuclear photography is actually a worldwide effort. It takes a lot of efforts from many different skills, computational skills, theoretical skills, experimental skills, as well as accelerator skills. And Jefferson Lab is one of the leading facilities in the world uh, that is basically doing this, poking the protons uh, with electrons. And you might say, well, you know, there have been other experiments like the Hera Collider that you just mentioned. Why do you need more experiments? Well, the thing is that at Jefferson Lab, we, we actually do these histograms in high definition. And high definition histogram is very important because it gives us the re higher resolution to tap into the structures of the, of the quarks and gluons inside of the proton. 
So Jefferson Lab, again, you know, it produces a very high quality histograms. And we are excited also uh, with the, with the uh, future electron ion collider that is going to get built at Brookhaven. Jefferson Lab is a partner of this endeavor. And this is going to be a, um, the, the first polarized uh, uh, um, collider where you can, we can actually prepare the polarization of the proton in different ways. And we can poke these weird structures of that, that we can actually find in, in the proton. And with that note, I will take any questions if there are any. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nabuo, um, for sharing the ins and outs of gluons. That was uh, really awesome. Um, we have some pre-submitted questions, and then we'll get to any questions that are in the chat. The first question is, why do you call the different uh, quarks flavors? What do you, why is that the term used? Oh, that is an excellent question. Um, so the naming is technically, you know, uh, for historical reasons, coming from before quarks and gluons were actually um, um, discovered entirely. But these days, you know, it's just a naming that has, you know, it's just kind of an organizational chart. If you go to a chemistry table, you can see sort of a classification of the atoms. And it is basically, this, it's just a naming convention. What matters at the end is that there are distinctive particles, there are six quarks and there are anti-quarks in, you know, in reality. And, you know, some of them actually make up the protons and neutrons that we know of. Okay. So uh, we have a question in the chat that said, what made you become interested in physics? That's an interesting question. Um, so I was always um, curious in high school about uh, concepts of physics. And I was actually not that good at physics, partially because I didn't understand at all. So I was actually motivated by really understanding what exactly it is. And that's how I really end up doing physics, because um, to be a physicist, you don't have to be a physicist. You have to be curious of what's going on. And that's actually what drives the science that are, at least from my side. Thank you. Can you share with us how small a femtometer is? Um, do you have any kind of comparison so we can understand better what that's like? Yeah, that's that's a good question. So I know that the, when I mentioned femtometer scales or 10 to the minus 15, this is something that we cannot really grasp. So if we were if we were to scale up the proton to the size of Earth, which we sort of kind of imagine the size of Earth, um, the size of the detector is actually much bigger than the size of the galaxy that we are in. So basically what we are trying to do is kind of looking at stuff way outside of the galaxy and see how humans are actually moving inside of it. And that's how uh, the scales are uh, analogous in, in connection with the quarks and gluons in experiments. Why do we need to repeat the measurement so frequently? So as I mentioned, we never see the quarks and gluons directly. So we cannot sort of open up the proton and see, oh, this is how it looks like. We have to actually poke them. And then this poke, you know, this poking produces these histograms that I mentioned. And this histogram becomes crisper and crisper once you repeat over and over. And in this getting, you know, Jefferson Lab is one of those places where the measurements are done many, many times. Now there are different facilities that are also doing the experiments in order to avoid the biases associated with the fact that the experiments are done also by humans. And there are human errors that normally are taken into account into experimental analysis. And then the idea is that by combining multiple experiments, we can finally get to the truth. We can sort of mitigate the origin of the biases. Okay, looks like we have another question in the chat. That question is, do the gluons qualify as bosons in the standard model categorization? Yes. 
So all the particles that are interacting um, with the with the quarks and with the with the with the fermions are basically gauge bosons. So those are the mediators. Yeah, it's, it is due to the nature of its spin. Okay, so you talked about a lot of different locations where experiments happen. Um, why do you need to do so many scattering experiments at so many different facilities to learn about quarks and gluons? Why can't you just do it at one location? So um, one important thing is that is that these things are so tiny, and then to me, to make sure that we know what we know today, we have to have some predictive power so that what we learn from one experiment can be used as to predict other measurement at other places. So it is this uh, endeavor of combining all the, all the experiments all together to be able to pin down, which gives us um, a solid understanding or confidence that what we are seeing and we are interpreting is actually correct. Because otherwise, it, you know, it gets a debate that maybe it's just an interpretation. But having multiple predictions to other facilities allows us to be bold and say, yeah, we are really understanding this. So I believe I heard you mention um, fermion. For those non-scientists, what does that mean? The fermions are a particular particle that carries a spin one half. Spin is a feature of particles. So in general, um, in physics, you know, if you want to characterize a system, you know, suppose you want to characterize a person, you characterize a person by his height, you know, by his weight, and so on and so forth. So we characterize also the particles using different physical quantities, such as the momentum or the spin. So those are intrinsic properties of the particles, and fermions are particular par particles that carry the spin one half. It's one of properties of them. Okay, thanks for that explanation. Um, if someone wants to become a nuclear physicist, what steps should they take? And I believe that that is our last question, unless um, there are more questions in the chat. Um, so when I started physics, um, I really, I, I had a dream, actually, that I thought it would be really cool to actually get paid by learning physics and doing physics. And I'm convinced that anyone who has that dream can actually achieve it. And the only thing that it takes is just to be patient and you know, be motivated and being curious. You know, the curiosity is the most important thing um, and because that drives you to keep doing it. And, and I believe that there are many opportunities uh, because the amount of people who, who knows about this is not actually not too many. And actually the science of an, Nuclear photography is actually pretty difficult. It requires more eyes and more brains. And I encourage people to really uh, consider the chances to become a nuclear physicist to explore this fascinating world of quarks and gluons. So basically what I'm hearing you say is stay curious always. <laughs> that's awesome. So I think that's it for today. Um, I am just going to kick it back to you. All right, thank you, Rebecca. Um, with that note, uh, let me close this uh, final uh, session of the Bite-Size Science at Jefferson Lab. Uh, this is the last one in our series for this year, and we plan to see you next year for more on this. Thank you very much for attending. See you next time.